Morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Janet, Janet Lalonde. I'm from uh, Payments Canada. I'm the manager of uh, payment operations. Um, and I'm just going to open our session this morning on remote deposit capture, make a couple of introductory comments, and then turn the floor over to our speaker. Um, I just wanted to say, first of all, I think that paper, paper in general, I think is you know one of the one of the history's greatest inventions, right up there with the wheel and the light bulb, um, because it allowed us to document, record events, record history, and to share knowledge. But I think in the in the context of payments, that we'd probably all agree that we'd like to see paper relegated to history. And uh, but uh, statistics show that both in Canada and in the U.S. That's not likely to happen anytime soon. Paper is declining. It's a declining uh, payment instrument, but it's declining slowly. And it's not set to disappear anytime really soon. So the next best thing to eradicating paper, I believe, is digitizing it. Um, the, um, um, the implementation of check image exchange and um, image deposit has really revolutionized uh, check processing. And it's brought a lot of benefits across the entire industry um, to financial institutions, customers, um, allowed uh, new opportunities and a lot of exciting things to happen. Um, Canada, to a certain degree, has been uh, playing catch up to the US with respect to our check imaging program. So we're just really starting to see this take off in Canada now. Um, since our framework was fully put into place in 2013, um, We've seen a lot of our members out there offering uh, remote uh, capture solutions at the bank machine, at the teller, uh, corporate and mobile, and that has really taken off. Some of our members, it's their, it's their uh, number one uh, source of accepting deposits. Um, and uh, in the background though today, a lot of those um, images that are being uh, captured from customers are still being printed and exchanged as paper. 80% uh, of them are still being printed and exchanged as paper. Uh, so 20% now are being exchanged electronically as image. And we do expect that number to continue to grow very quickly. We've reached 20% just uh, since October of last year. So that has grown quite quickly. Um, and we're expecting to be fully image exchanged um, at some point over the, next, over the next couple of years. So I'm very excited today to be able to welcome uh, John Leakley uh, here. John is the founder and CEO of RemoteDepositCapture.com, uh, which is a trade association for the RDC industry. John has over 20 years experience in banking, uh, focused largely in cash management, product management, strategy, and development. Uh, since founding uh, RemoteDepositCapture.com, John has uh, been a featured speaker at many industry uh, conferences and events. And his organization hosts an annual conference on RDC, which I've attended four times. So I'm really excited to be able to host uh, John here at the Payments Canada conference. Uh, one other thing I'd like to say is that John has himself, uh, his organization and himself have been a really valuable source of information for us in Canada as we work through uh, our, uh, our image strategy and our implementation. Um, so I encourage everyone to take advantage of his uh, deep knowledge and expertise and ask him lots of questions. So All welcome, right. John. Thank you, Tim. Good morning, everybody. Hey, wow, I got some actual good mornings. <laughs> Not too many hangovers, hopefully. Let's cross our fingers. How about that rodeo last night? Who went to that rodeo? Hopefully most of you. I thought that was fantastic. Um, uh, also, uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm honored to be here. I think this conference has turned out to be a phenomenal conference. So uh, kudos to the staff at uh, Payments Canada for a great conference so far. Uh, this presentation is a little bit unlike some of the other presentations that you've often seen today. When I got the template to do the presentation, it said, please try to keep the, to, uh, keep the uh, presentation to no more than four slides or so and do a lot of speaking and so forth. Uh, I, I think the presentation is about 27 slides or something. I don't know. So long story short, we're going to fly through the slides. I don't read the slides per se, but we're going to have fun reading one in a moment. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk you through really what the title of the, the session is. Some of the evolution that, that we've seen in RDC uh, in the U.S., some of the lessons learned, insights in the road ahead. And as mentioned, uh, RemoteDepositCapture.com is the de facto trade association for the RDC industry. So we work with literally thousands of financial institutions that come visit our website, hundreds that come to our conference every year and so forth. 
And so it's, it's been a lot of fun. I'm, I'm an ex-banker, uh, and it's been 21 years since I presented at what was then the Canadian Payments Association meeting. And ironically, 21 years ago, I presented on largely the same thing. Uh, I was on a project doing remote capture for southbound U.S. dollar cash letters uh, when I was at Bankers Trust, and we, we set that shop up in Mississauga, and some of you might remember some of that. So uh, we'll get going here because we've got a lot of ground to cover, everything from evolution to a look ahead and everything in between. One of the things we'll, we'll highlight is we're now doing an annual survey of the remote deposit capture industry focused on the mobile aspect of remote deposit capture. And I invite all of you, it's for financial institutions. So let me, let me see a showing of hands. How many are representing financial institutions in the room? Most of you, fantastic. I'm also scared now because I'm going to get lots of questions. Um, the survey is open to the broader remote deposit capture industry, whether you're in the U.S. or Canada. So I encourage you to take it. We'll share the summary results with you probably in August or September if you do take the, the survey. So uh, I encourage you to do that. So initial reactions to RDC. This was funny. I've, I've been battling the naysayers my, my entire career since founding RemoteDepositCapture.com back in 2005. Oh, it's never going to work. What are you, crazy to send the other thing? So let's have some fun and read these quotes together. Let's read this first one. Here we go. It will be at least a decade before image exchange becomes mainstream. Well, the reality is it happened pretty darn quickly. Uh, check 21 was, was enacted in 2004. Over 90% of checks were cleared as images by the end of 2010. In fact, I might be a little bit late on that, uh, according to a Federal Reserve presentation that I saw yesterday. Uh, they were saying that it reached that number in 2008, 2009. Let's read this next one. IRDs are a stupid idea. Well, if you want to go from point A to point B, you can't just snap your fingers and get there tomorrow. There has to be some steps in between. And that's the role that IRDs, image replacement documents, played in the United States. And it was a really critical role because it helped not only bridge the gap, but it also created some financial incentives to get up and running on image exchange sooner rather than later. Because if you have to not only have the paper to begin with, but take an image and then print it out somewhere else and then send that paper wherever, that's more costly, right? And so it was a nice stopgap. Let's read this next one. Oh, here we go. I already served a critical business purpose. Okay, you get the idea. I'll be damned if I'm going to turn our tellers into sorter operators. Oh boy, did I hear this a lot when, when financial institutions were thinking about uh, putting remote deposit capture in their branch operations, whether back counter or front counter. But check this out. Teller capture has imp helped improve service, reduce errors, accelerate clearing, and ironically, has helped to sell RDC. Most financial institutions in the US initially had a negative reaction to teller or branch capture. But then the few leaders that were out there started showing them the benefits. The earlier you clear checks in the US, the lower the, the cost if you clear through the Fed, for example. And so you eliminated all the transportation time. You're capturing the checks as they come in. And so it also helped catch errors with customer deposits right at the teller line. So that helped improve service and eliminate all the, the research and error adjustments that happened kind of as a day two function. Last but not least, RDC is an acceptable risk for business customers, but consumers, are you kidding me? So back in 2008 at the RDC Summit, we had Jim DiBello, the CEO of MyTech, which is, if you will, if you think of Intel inside in most PCs, MyTech is the company that it, that powers a lot of the mobile deposit solutions offered by companies like NCR or RDM or a bunch of the others. Um, and so my, Jim DiBello was up there on stage in 2008 and he put this idea out to the audience. And the poor guy almost got booed off stage. And so it, it may have been last year or the year before I had Jim back and I said, aren't all these the people who uh, booed you off stage just about a few years ago? Yep, yep, yep. Uh, aren't they all your customers now? Yep, yep, yep. So it was pretty interesting. And MRDC has really proven to be a key driver in 
uh, mobile banking adoption in the US. It's a very useful feature. So one of the key things that I've observed over the years, all these naysayers, as I've mentioned before, they keep saying, oh, nope, it's not possible. Oh, it's too costly to roll this out to consumers. It's too costly to roll it out to small businesses. Oh, these are a stupid idea, this, that, and the other thing. But along the way, the underlying framework evolved. Technology continued to evolve and get better. Initial RDC implementations were thick client. In other words, someone had to go out there and install software on a PC. Nowadays, it's thin client, browser-based, and not only that, but doesn't even need to be installed on the servers of the bank. It's hosted in the cloud by the solution providers. So time and time again, RDC has overcome these challenges through the advancements within the technologies, applications of RDC technologies in new and different ways, and integration and expansion of those technologies. And that's a core theme that, that we've seen time and time again. And so here's a great quote that I think is very applicable. Skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it has been. One of the, uh, uh, the keynote speakers talked about the advancements of technology and Moore's law. You know, technology doubles every 18 months or what have you. Uh, another keynote speaker held up this cell phone and said, this is more powerful than the computers that put the man on the moon in 1969. Held up that, that uh, credit card and said, the chip that's in here was developed in 1974 and it's largely the same today. So in general, it seems like payments don't evolve quite as fast as the overall technology. And I think RDC is an example of where you're starting to see the underlying technologies within payments evolve faster and faster. And we're finding new applications and creating be better business cases for it along the way. Of course, that was the great one that gave us that quote, skating to where the puck is going to be. So moral of the story, if you're developing or getting into the RDC space today, don't develop a solution that's based upon yesterday or even today's technologies and markets and use cases. Think a little bit more forward about how can this be used. And we'll talk about some of those trends momentarily. So today, what are we looking at? Well, RDC in the US is really a ubiquitous offering, a special mobile remote deposit capture. If you're a financial institution in the US and you don't offer RDC, and specifically mobile deposit, you are viewed as a dinosaur. You really are. And my, how quickly that has happened. RDC only really started, the Check 21 legislation is kind of the, when the official gun went off. So we're looking at less than 12 years that RDC has been around. But it's been a fun ride along the way. RDC also, it's not a payment type. Gets, some people confuse RDC with the check payment type solely. And yes, RDC started out as a way to truncate checks, but it's evolved to so much more. There are some more sophisticated implementations and uses of RDC as an integrated receivables and payments hub at some of the larger uh, uh, corporations in the US. Uh, we had American Red Cross speak at the RDC Summit a couple years ago. They are using RDC as, if you will, their core system, and they've added the ability to capture cash checks, uh, cash checks, uh, ACH, uh, as well as donor coupons, so forth and so on, and it's all integrated to all their back-end systems. So don't look at this just as a payment type, but it's a technology and a channel that can handle multiple payment types and all the data that surrounds the transaction. RDC has also proven to be a way to, on how to manage payments risk. Really for the first time in the US, uh, as RDC was being implemented, uh, most financial institutions, and there was guidance from our regulators that said, if you're going to offer this new channel, and it can potentially have all those different payment types and be integrated in all these different ways, you have to incorporate all aspects of risk management across all the traditional silos of banking. And so as that has progressed, and the results are in, so to speak, and it's been a very successful model of how to do enterprise payments risk more and more financial institutions are adopting that across the silo model of payments risk as opposed to payments risk management within check, payments risk management within ACH, or payments risk management within wires. It's a more cohesive and holistic approach. And RDC is also fueling 
fundamental change in how banking is done in the U.S., especially within branches. Uh, Sixty plus percent of all transactions at branches were driven because of the check. And when you take the need away to go to that bank branch in order to deposit checks, it fundamentally changes how bank branches are used and what's possible to be done with bank branches. Bank of America, J.P. Morgan Chase, for example, have shed since their peaks in whichever year that was. Uh, Bank of America, I think I just read, is down 15 to 20 percent in terms of the number of branches it has in the United States. Pretty interesting food for thought there. And they're using their branches in different ways. As opposed to a transaction center, it's now they're, they're transforming them into relationship centers. And a lot of other banks are doing the exact same thing. So risk management and compliance, this is the big hot topic always, it seems, risk management. Um, RDC, lots of folks were scared at first. And then as they started having some experience with it, and the technology changed, and that's a big area where the technology changed, better and better and better ways to close that window of opportunity for the fraudsters, monitoring, reporting, what have you. Um, it turned out that risk was more bark than bite. Now there is risk in any payments channel, there's risk in any payments type, and there are risks and there are losses in RDC. However, the results are awfully compelling. Since the birth of RDC, for example, in the United States, the return item rate, not the volume, checks are declining somewhat, but the rate, the X per thousand, if you will, um, has dropped over 20%. So the industry used to be about one half of 1% of all checks came back as return items for a number of reasons. Uh, account closed to non-sufficient funds to fraudulent checks, whatever the reason may be, you lump them all together as one half of 1%. Since the advent of remote deposit capture, and especially since the advent of mobile remote deposit capture, the return item rate, and this is data according to the Federal Reserve, has dropped over 20%. So it went from 0.5% of all items processed down to less than 0.3%. Maybe it's a coincidence, but I'd like to think not. It's, it's, it, it, it was at that 0.5% for decades. So the risk of non-compliance now may be the biggest issue in terms of RDC risk management. Making sure you have all the tools and processes and guidelines and policies in place to effectively manage risk. And that's very, very important. If you have all those, that's why you're going to be able to survive without seeing a lot of losses. And the evolution of risk management has changed as well. Not just with the technologies, but if you're imaging a check and you're sending it through, well that check, now 99 point something percent of all checks in the US are cleared no later than the next day. And a growing percentage of those get cleared even same day. So with check image exchange, you're seeing near real time, I mean as, as close as you can get potentially, to near real time settlement of check clearing. It's pretty impressive. Along with that came the need for, instead of day two risk management, which was the norm, came the need for day one risk management and even real time risk management. What we're seeing in the US as well now is there are a growing number of financial institutions that are offering through remote deposit capture the ability for their customers to receive immediate availability. And behind the scenes, what they're doing is a process of either check verification or check guarantee. And so they're clearing it potentially same day or next day, so they're not even, there's not even really a float issue there either. So risk management has increasingly become real time, and I think that's, that's better for all of us across all the payment silos. So some of the things we do on the website is we pull the industry, we conduct surveys and so forth. And so I'm gonna throw a smattering of information here at you. Uh, we won't go through every data point, but I thought this was interesting. This is a question that uh, we get frequently on check destruction timeframes. 294 responses to this, so it's, it's pretty representative. And as you can see, it's your typical bell curve. Uh, and so most financial institutions recommend to their clients to destroy the the captured items 31 to 45 days after deposit. That has to do with a number of things, the logic behind that. Um, won't have a lot of time to get into that today, but I wanted to share this with you. This answers some questions. 
The other aspect to this is when it comes to mobile deposit as opposed to desktop deposit, this, this includes the entire industry, if you will. But mobile deposit, the check destruction timeframes are typically even shorter. I'm a Bank of America customer, and they tell me that I can uh, uh, destroy the item, I think they say six to 10 days, something like that. So um, mobile deposit opens up the opportunity to tell the customer to destroy them even earlier. But what's the value prop? Does the industry really, does, do the end users really value RDC, and in this case, mobile RDC. Well, we conducted a poll in 2015 about this, and, and up to 25 cents, 50 dollars, so forth and so on. And so you see the 2015 results. We just got done conducting this poll, and actually, a lot of these polls are still live and open on our website. Uh, and if you go to our website, uh, you can take probably about a dozen different polls out there. And if you take the poll, once you take the poll, you can see the overall results. So this will be really handy for you. So these numbers may have changed a little bit because the poll is still open. But as you can see, there's a shift in the value perception of mobile RDC amongst the industry. And so while the highest in 2015 was a quarter or less in value per transaction, now that has shifted over to the value perception is up to a dollar per transaction. So people are beginning to understand hey, if I can eliminate that trip to the bank and save all that time, as well as instead of carrying that check around for a week or so in my wallet, I can just snap a photo with my phone. That's really convenient. And so you're seeing a growing value proposition. So I'm not going to go through this now, uh, but folks apparently can download this presentation uh, through the app, and I think a, a link will be sent out to you after the conference as well from Payments Canada. Um, but let's take a look at the 2015 Mobile Remote Deposit Capture Industry Study that we conducted. Over 300 financial institutions participated. You see the basic breakdown here, mainly banks, and it's a typical distribution of the size of those financial institutions participating. Uh, in the U.S., there are close to 10,000 financial institutions. Obviously, the majority of them are mid to smaller size, and there are only a few of the big boys, so to speak. But this, uh, this is very representative of what you see in, in the industry in terms of size distribution. So let's jump right to the, the good stuff, losses. Losses really are minimal and isolated. We ask the question, has your FI incurred any losses directly attributable to mobile RDC? And we got some responses back uh, that were interesting. But overall, 76% of financial institutions said no. Now as time goes by, the law of large numbers is going to catch up with everybody, I think eventually everyone's going to say, yep, I had a loss in mobile RDC. But the question really is, how tolerable is that? Is it within your risk appetite? Uh, and, and if you have had a loss, you know, does it prompt you to do anything else? Now, 24% said they had losses, but some of them included losses like uh, non-sufficient funds. That's not directly attributable to mobile RDC. NSF return items existed long before mobile RDC ever existed. So what is unique to mobile RDC is this issue of duplicate items. I've got some really juicy details for you about that in a moment. Also, what segment caused the losses, if you will? And most banks saw the losses in the retail consumer segment. Small business is starting to grow and corporations, not all that many. The reactions to the losses is what's really interesting. And this was a fun question. Uh, way back in college, my minor was sociology and survey methods. And so I was thinking, how do I apply this, all this time I spent in college on survey methods and sociology? And so I had fun doing this uh, survey. Um, so if you've had a loss, have you, have you changed anything you do to prevent them in the future? It's a very probing question. It's a very telling question because what I was surprised at was the no. Yeah, 53%. You would expect if someone got burnt, they would change what they do so they don't get burnt again, unless they answer no, which states that the losses were so minimal, they felt no need to change their policies and procedures. In fact, most FIs were very surprised at the lack of risk and losses within the mobile RDC channel. So who are they offering it to? Well, 100% of the respondents that are currently offering RDC offer it to their retail consumers. 100% of respondents. 
Um, I thought that was pretty good. 65% um, offer it to small business, 29% to corporations. Now, the 29% to corporations, it may look low, but you have to remember, a lot of those mid-tier and smaller financial institutions don't do treasury management banking for corporates and businesses. They do you know, consumer banking, and that's what they do. So that 29% is never going to reach 100% because there are a lot of banks in the US that just don't offer these types of services to corporations. Um, what's interesting here are expansion plans. Consumers, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, table stakes. You have to offer MRDC, no doubt about that. But there's a, the new battleground is among the small business customers in the US. There are over 26 million small businesses and something like 20 million of them are, small, are sole proprietorships. So six million multi-employee small businesses in the US. It's a, it's, a, it's a great service, especially for them, when you think about all the myriad of different types of businesses that uh, small businesses offer. Um, and checks are the preferred payment type, even in Canada, with, for small businesses, but also in the United States. And when you think about small businesses, you're often thinking about you know, that little mom and pop store on the corner, and you're thinking, oh, that's normally credit cards, right? Well, you're correct on that front. But there are many, many, many more small businesses. The HVAC company, your landscaper, the plumber, the electrician, there are, I think the number is seven times the number of small businesses out there, uh, more than the small retail shops that you typically see. So there's a lot of small businesses where they deal almost exclusively in checks. Funds availability, here's an interesting one. And I wanted to provide a little bit of an update. Uh, as we mentioned, the MRDC survey is currently underway. And we're seeing a bit of shifting among some of these responses this year. So these were the 2015 results. And as you can see, 54% offer next day availability. And it's a fairly even distribution on either side of that um, in terms of availability provision. What we're starting to see this year, and, and I had a hunch it was a bit of a trend. Uh, there's no little laser beam on this one. Same day if deposit is made before specific time or immediate. In years gone by, when a lot of banks first offered MRDC, they offered immediate availability. And some of them had some problems with that. So some of the lessons learned were, hey, maybe we shouldn't offer immediate availability to our customers right away. Let's start out offering them next day or two days. So here in 2016, what we're seeing is a shift away from immediate and same day to next day and potentially even two day. Ooh, okay, now I get to hold two. Awesome. Oh, I can use either one. Wow. Look at that, I can. All right, so uh, availability is a question we get asked uh, as well. So what are the perceptions among the US financial institutions of, of remote deposit capture, and specifically MRDC? Well, it's a home run. It really is a home run. Here's what the overall industry looks at. Uh, MRDC as. Uh, only 8% say it's a loss leader due to the cost and risk. But what was interesting in the study was there were a host of financial institutions that don't offer mobile RDC yet. So what if we took a look at just those who are currently offering mobile RDC and the number changes? And the number changes fairly drastically. We're down to 5% just say it's a loss leader due to the cost and risk. 61% say it far outweighs the cost and risk. So experience matters. And so here's the juicy tidbit I wanted to share with you. So we kept getting asked this question again and again. How bad is the fraud? How bad are those duplicate issues? And yes, they're a headache, and, and I think they pop up on radar screens because it's a new process. And bankers typically react to change with fear and screaming, right? Um, and so here's a new type of risk, and who wants a new type of risk? Nobody wants a new type of risk in general. But if you think about it, okay, I've got a new type of risk. However, with these technologies, I'm better able to manage risk, not only within the check payment type, but across the silos 
better able to service my customers, save money, this, that, and the other thing. So we actually asked the financial institutions last year that took the survey, can you share some basic details with us? How many mobile RDC items did you process and how many did you take a loss on? And we actually got data for over 23 million items processed from over a dozen different financial institutions. And we were able to calculate a duplicate loss rate. And it's a lot lower than I, even I expected. The duplicate loss rate, um, I've got over 21.3. There, there have been some additions to that. The duplicate loss rate is 0.0104%. So in other words, one out of every 10,000 items. And that number might even be a little bit high. So that's a pretty low rate in the grand scheme of things, extremely low. So let's start looking ahead a little bit. Where are we going? Well, mobile deposit really is the hottest part of the RDC industry right now in terms of growth of users. Uh, it's easy to get out there. You download your bank's app and you're up and running in a heartbeat. Um, and this information was provided by MyTech. And you can see in the third quarter of 2014 to the, let's just go with the third quarter of 2015, that's about 50% growth in one year in the number of financial institutions up and running with mobile deposit. And that number is, it looks like it's a fairly linear line. It continues to this day. I'll be getting the updated numbers from, from my tech in not too long. So we're seeing continued adoption and growth. It's table stakes. If you don't have it, you're behind the industry. So right now there's a bit of this race to get up and running with mobile RDC. But, so you get up and running with it. Remember, you want to skate to where the puck is going to be, not to where it has been. So where is mobile deposit going? Well, we see some, some trends, and it's not just in mobile deposit, it's in RDC in general. But for mobile deposit, we're looking at multi-check capture capabilities that leverage both the camera and the video functionality within the smartphone. It's pretty neat leveraging those different types of technologies in a device that your customers already have. So there's no incremental cost to them. There's no incremental cost to you. Very, very cool. So the multi-check, because people would say, well, mobile deposit is great if you have got one check or two, but if I've got five checks, I'm just driving to the bank. Well, the technology continues to evolve to make it even easier. So they're raising the bar on and they're expanding the market for who can use mobile deposit. And that's important because for a financial institution, offering mobile deposit versus offering a desktop solution, uh, if there's a, an additional cost associated with that desktop solution, that's another hurdle that you're going to have to overcome. So that's the advantage of mobile deposit in this case. But with the desktop solutions, a lot of businesses especially want to capture not just the check, but the invoice, the payment stubs, so forth and so on. And so RDC is evolving into this integrated receivables capability that can capture not just the payment, but can capture the transaction and all the related data. And that is the hardest heavy lifting part, if you will, for a lot of businesses. That back-end accounting, reconciliation, updating of customer records, and so forth. So if you can leverage technology to help to automate that in any way, shape, or form, as well as clear those payments faster and easier, that's a win-win for, for everybody. Um, if we look at the bottom, on the risk management front, there's some exciting things happening in this front today. Uh, I saw somebody reply to the 2016 MRDC survey, and they disagreed with me that the only type of, of fraud uniquely attributable to mobile RDC is this issue of duplicates. They said uh, counterfeit and fraudulent check fraud uh, is at increased risk because of mobile RDC. Well, I disagree with that statement because the technology exists and it's out there as the solution providers are offering this today, where, if, where you can analyze the front and the back of the check, analyze the signatures. You can even analyze the check itself to identify, is this the official check from this account or is this a fraudulent check? It actually measures the placements of things on the check. And there's even some new uh, capabilities that are coming to market that can tie the front and the back of the check together so you, so you know, is that the back of the 
this check, how do you know? And so there, there are growing technologies out there for that. So here's another interesting question. Opportunity ahead. How mature is the remote deposit capture industry? Um, again, time and time again, uh, folks have said to us, oh, there's not much gas left in the tank. And then the industry grows another 20, 30%. Oh, no, now this year, we're not going to grow much more. And then the industry grows another 20, 30%. Remember, the as the technology evolves and it gets better, more applicable, and more accessible to more people, the market expands. And so what we're seeing here is for the industry overall, we had 339 total responses to this. In 2016, the industry thinks we can grow at least 200% from here on out. That's a tremendous opportunity here. And there are people who think we can grow 10 times. Not many people think that we're we've got less than 50%. Not many people think we have less than a doubling from here. So in other words, even though the industry is 12 years old, we have a long way to go. In terms of small business predictions, um, what percentages of small business? This is a poll we have. Uh, this is our featured poll of the month right now. Uh, by the end of, and this was last year, 2015. We've got 2016s going on right now, so please take that. Uh, but in 2015, uh, for small business, again, you see a great opportunity because I look at the other side of this question. How many will be using it by the end of the year? I really look at, well, how many are left that could be using it in future years? What's our potential growth again? And as you can see, most of the industry feels we're less than halfway there with small businesses. And I will argue that uh, the 2016 results will be comparable to this, if not, the industry also feeling that there's even more opportunity that lies ahead. So what's the future? We had some fun with some of the polls, uh, spacing different polls out across time, you know, spacing it out maybe six months, asking a similar question with different verbiage to see, okay, let's make sure the industry really feels this way. So what capabilities and functionality hold the greatest opportunity as we look ahead? Uh, for improvement. Real-time risk management came up on top, but look at this, number two, three, four, and five. Leveraging RDC is a multi-payment channel, so not just doing checks, but doing everything else. Big opportunity there. Integration capabilities with, and that says, corporate back-end systems. So ensuring straight through process automation for these, these transactions is growing as a hot button issue. So you guys can look through the rest of that. But then we ask the question about integrated receivables. So remote deposit capture goes by a bunch of different names, but what's been interesting over the past couple of years is this concept of integrated receivables is kind of hot. It's gaining some steam in the US. When you take a look under the hood, what's at the core of this normally is a remote deposit capture solution that's been built upon and expanded. And so, what are the most important capabilities? Look at this, multi-payment capabilities, integration with corporate back-end systems. Um, this is a neat one, Image Capture Association archiving of the documents and the data. I think that is a, a great area for improvement for the industry. I challenge the RDC industry and the solution providers in here to make that easier for corporates and financial institutions to offer that back-end document archive, if you will. So some interesting data there about the future. But the road ahead, what do I see? What does the industry see in general? We see mass adoption of RDC. We've already seen it. There are over 100 million users in the US of mobile RDC today. Um, the, the number of active users is estimated to be around 60 million, but both of those numbers are growing. Uh, there's an increasing role of third-party solutions. Um, you know, we've got, a lot of these, uh, we heard a lot about FinTech and FinTegration and this, that, and the other thing. There are a lot of companies out there that are leveraging RDC technologies to provide some pretty cool services. A recent announcement from uh, one vendor talked about how uh, instead of remote deposit capture, it's remote payment capture. And so for um, rent collections, renters can take a photo of a check and send it to their landlord, as opposed to sending a check to the landlord and the landlord taking an image of the check. 
the renter, the, the person who's writing the check, takes a photo, sends it in, and they keep the check as a receipt. That's pretty cool. You're, you're moving that point of capture out as far as possible. Um, RDC is a payments platform. We talked about that. Data, the final frontier. That's, that's really a lot of where I think the future of RDC lies, is in the data of monitoring, reporting, and taking action on the transactions within the system, as well as capturing the data of the transactions and integrating into back-end systems and so forth. So a couple questions. Does a check even need to be paper? Why don't I just take one photo of one of my checks, and any time I need to send someone a check, I just type in, make it payable to uh, Payments Canada for a million dollars, and hit submit, and they get the electronic image of the check. So it never exists in paper to begin with. It's a concept that I think has legs. People are familiar with how to use this payment type. They're now familiar with how to use the technology. Why not get rid of the paper? Because it's all about the data. If you think about the paper, it's data instructions. Debit this account, credit this account, this much on this date. That's all a check is. It doesn't, I don't think, really need to be paper except for the rules, laws, legislations, things like that, but maybe those can change. So with that, how are we doing? We have a few minutes for questions. Fantastic. All right. Um, so uh, if anyone has a question, please raise your hand. Ideally, I bet they're probably recording this. Come up to the microphone. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, we've got a few minutes for questions. But I wanted just to remind everyone, please do, if you're a financial institution, take the survey on mobile RDC. Your, your input would be appreciated. And we share the summary results with you. Um, and as uh, Janet mentioned, We've got our RDC Summit coming up in September. Uh, you might want to check that out and just visit our website as well. Uh, we're, we're here for the industry. So any questions? Oh, come on. There we go. Oh, there we go. <laughs> it's OK, I have a list too. All of a sudden. Come on up. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. I'll, I'll repeat the question. Okay. It's a great question, great question. The question is, um, why do I think that return item rate has gone down? Uh, and I think one of the major contributing factors is indeed that the checks are clearing faster. Um, I would love to know some of the details of, has the return item rate gone down for business to business checks, more or less than the return item rate going down for consumer checks? But I would guess that you know, if, if someone has a check from grandma, they stick it in the drawer, it's a nice birthday gift, they forget about it, and then you know, a number of months later they write the check and oops, that account's closed or there's not enough funds in it. But when she wrote the check, the money was there. So I think that is probably a major contributing factor to why the return item rate indeed has gone down. Yep. Next question. Yeah, and, and that's, uh, that's a great question. The question is, what percentage of duplicates are fraudulent versus mistakes versus errors or, or what have you? Um, at first in the industry, there were a lot of duplicates generated because there were systemic errors in the clearing process of those images. The image cache letter would be accidentally sent twice or some type of error like that. And so at first, the, the issue of duplicates was, oh my god, what the heck's going on here? I've got thousands of duplicates. The industry has learned its lessons, figured out how to do the checks and balances, so that rarely, if ever, happens anymore. So the next question is, well, of the duplicates that remain, how many are truly a fraud attempt versus an accident? And what I've heard through the industry, and I don't have real hard numbers on this, but what I've heard through the industry and working with a lot of the FIs is, most of the duplicates that come through right now are accidental. And the industry's gotten very good about identifying duplicates very quickly. Um, the, a lot of them have duplicate detection capabilities. At the very least, within the mobile deposit channel, 
if not within the entire RDC channel and ideally including ACH converted items as well and in clearing items. Um, and so what banks are doing is when a person gets up and running with a mobile RDC, for example, they'll, they'll put them on a probationary status, if you will, because they have seen, and this is a fact, most duplicates uh, per account happen within the first six months. It's because the person's not familiar with the system. They, they took a photo of the item and they're not sure that it actually was deposited, so they'll do it again. Or they'll take the physical item down to the ATM or the branch and do it again. And so most duplicates are appearing within the first six months. So being sure you've got things locked down, being monitored, and you can take action on any of that reporting. If you see a duplicate pop up, suspend that client's activity, call them and talk to them. That's now what's kind of the norm in the industry. So new clients are kind of on a probationary period and then once they see that, all right, this client knows how to use it, they tend to increase limits and things like that. I think we're out of time. Oh, all Scott, right. well, we'll let you go, Scott, and then we'll uh, let everybody head to their coffee break. I think you had slides about the value of a, a mobile Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. And then the other question would be, is it common practice in the United States to charge the signature guy, or is it an operation? Another great question. All right, so the value, well, that wasn't what I wanted. There, there we are. Um, this question is the value to the end user. Okay, so if you were to use mobile deposit, how much, how much value do you find in that? number one. So that's the end user. It's not to the financial institution. For financial institutions, uh, Celent, uh, a major industry research firm in the U.S., uh, they're global actually, um, they did some analysis and they came up with, with rough numbers of a check transaction deposited at a teller, that check. All in all, when you add up all the cost, costs that financial institution something like $2.50 when you add up all the costs, the, the teller, the overhead, the systems, transport, capture, whatever, $2.50 versus mobile deposit, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase has come out and said a mobile deposited item costs them less than a dime. They've actually said a, a number of even less than that. So that is the great value of mobile deposit to most financial institutions. So the next question is, how are financial institutions charging? Most are not. And the theory they subscribe to there is, if I'm going to save, you know, let's, let's cut the 250 in half. If I'm going to save even a dollar per transaction on a check that's deposited with me, I'm not going to charge the customer for that because every time they do that, saves me money. And so most financial institutions do not charge their retail consumer base for mobile RDC. And we actually ask these questions and it's in... Uh, there's a, a, a webinar on our site that's freely available that goes into a lot more detail on mobile deposit. It answers that question very specifically. It also answers the question, what percentage of FIs charge? And this year, we're even asking, how much do you charge? So more data is going to be coming out about that. But less than 15% of FIs in the U.S. Charge, for mo charge their retail consumer customers for mobile deposit. And if they do, it's typically a quarter or 50 cents per transaction. Okay. All right, sorry we're out of time, but if you do have additional questions, come see me or visit our website. Thank you everyone, have a great rest of the conference.